بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم بی سٹارٹ فائیو زیرو نائن زیرو او لیول دس آلسو کورز آئی جی سی ایس سی جی سی ایس سی دس از چیپٹر سکسٹین پوائنٹ تھری نائن ٹل سکسٹین پوائنٹ تھری تھرٹین اینڈ وی گونٹ بی ڈسکسنگ سیکشول ریپروڈکشن اینڈ پلانٹس اینڈ بیسکلی وی گونٹ بی ڈسکسنگ سیڈ جرمینیشن وٹ از گونٹ ہیپن آفٹر فرٹیلائزیشن وی اسٹارٹ ایوری سیشن ود بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم بیکاز آئی تھنک Uh, it gives you a lot of sense of uh, well-being and you do very well when you are starting anything with the uh, with the sentence bismillahir rahmanir rahim now coming to the syllabus 16.3 part 9 structure of a seed we've got to do then you've got to understand that seed and fruit dispersal by wind and animals uh, this helps in colonizing new areas and reducing competition then we have to relate the features of wind dispersed fruit and animal dispersed fruit so the fruit we have to talk about then you know investigate the environmental conditions that affect germination of seeds and this as i told you earlier is temperature water and oxygen temperature water and oxygen and then we have to describe the process of germination including the role of enzymes now Well, post fertilization the zygote grows repeatedly by mitosis to form an embryo so here we've got the zygote and zygote one cell is going to divide into a ball of cells and this is going to then form the embryo so some of it will going to develop into the radical and some of it will develop into the plumule and then we will have the cotyledons so the cotyledons will develop so basically the zygote is everything The zygote is the beginning of every living organism and then this is going to have the original ovule which is going to have the original outer covering of the ovule which will then be called the testa or the seed coat. So now as you look at the structure of a seed, this is the place, the hilum is the place where it was attached to the pea plant. Like you have the pea here and so where it was attached to the pea, so the pea plant. And then we look at it, there's a tiny hole which is called the micropyle. through which the pollen tube actually entered so hilum and a micropyle and then when we look at the seed basically you've got to understand the radical and the plumule which make up the embryo the rest i'm not going to label and then there's the cotyledons you see some seeds have main food is endosperm but we're not going to talk about the endosperm we're just going to talk about the cotyledons and then the outer covering is the, called the seed coat or the testa and then the food store is the cotyledons So basically, I mean, just simplifying it a little more, uh, the seeds will have three parts. Number one is the seed coat, which is also called the testa. And then we have the embryo, which is consisting of a young root and a shoot, which will develop into the adult plant. And then the second, so second is the embryo and third is the food store. So the food store is going to mainly starch for the young plant to use until it is large enough to make its own food or till its leaves develop so that it can start to photosynthesize. Now another diagram for you to really see it plumule the first leaves and radical is going to be the root so r radical r root this is how you remember it hilum was the point where it was attached to the ovary wall micropyle is that little pore uh, through which the pollen tube enters and through which water is going to be absorbed when we set up this uh, seed for germination and then we have the seed coat or the testa Now, when we plant a seed in the soil, what does it need? It needs an adequate temperature, it needs water, it needs oxygen. It does not need air. Why do we say air is wrong? Why? Because air contains a whole lot of other gases like nitrogen and carbon dioxide. But we don't need all of that. We only need the oxygen. So that is how we remember it. Temperature, water and oxygen. Now, when we plant the seed in the soil, you can see what is happening. The first thing is that the water is absorbed and the testa splits and the radical moves out. and then you see how the cotyledons are now going to be moved up and then we see the the little baby plant starting to grow and then you can see the first leaves starting to develop and the cotyledons now have reduced in mass because all the food store has been used up just like you go to school you take a lunch box and then when you come back well you've eaten up all that lunch whatever you had in it whether you had a sandwich or fries or whatever you had in it you actually consumed it so similarly the food store has been consumed and we're going to discuss that how that is consumed by the help of enzymes the starch and the fat and the protein you see seeds contain fats that's why you get olive oil 
or corn oil you crush the seeds and you get this oil out of them so all the all that the seed has to be done is it has to be provided the adequate temperature it has to be provided water and has to be provided oxygen and it will germinate and you might throw it in any direction but the radical will always grow down and the plumule which will develop into the shoot will always grow upwards we're going to talk about uh, the how can we do an experiment to investigate the factors necessary for germination so you will have to take four uh, test tubes or beakers or whatever you want to take and you will have to put you have to soak the seeds beforehand and then put at least four to six or four to eight or four to ten seeds in it because you can't put one seed because if something's wrong with that genetically then that will not germinate and you think oh we that's the condition necessary for germination so in one you're going to have uh, you're going to place this now of course this is a is at 4 degrees celsius this will not uh, germinate because the temperature is too low now this is in a dry so dry there's no water in it so this will also not germinate this will also not germinate now this one we we put a chemical in it pyrogalol which absorbs oxygen so there is no oxygen here so this will also not germinate here oxygen will present this will germinate and of course we don't need light either so no light but some seeds need light not all of them but some seeds do need light so they will not so this one will also germinate so conditions necessary for germination you've got to understand is you've got to change the condition one will of course have all the three present that means that it will be an adequate temperature this was of course a very low temperature so this did not germinate then this was dry cotton wool so this would not germinate so no water available and this was no oxygen so this would not germinate but this was had all the stuff so this would be the control for comparison now another way to have no air in it or no because air contains the oxygen what you do is you put a thin layer of oil over it and you have the wet cotton wool and the soaked peas and you have the plastic beaker and a cling film with holes in it so the air would uh, the oil would prevent the air entering and of course the air contains the oxygen now another way of describing this uh, to investigate the conditions necessary for germination procedure place crushed seeds in cotton wool in each test tube add moist cotton wool to one add water which is cooled after boiling to another and cover it with oil this means that there will be no oxygen add dry cotton wool to another no water keep another in the fridge so no heat so uh, we come to the topic of enzymes and how they are used in seed germination now basically what has to happen is that the radical and the plumule have to grow that means mitosis has to take place and more and more cells have to be added now how is that going to happen you see you got the food store you got the food store as starch <clears throat> now the starch has to be converted to maltose now how is it going to be converted to maltose because the enzyme amylase will be produced by the embryo plant and this amylase is going to go to the cotyledons where the starch is going to be converted to maltose and then there's going to be an enzyme maltase which is going to convert it to glucose and then the glucose is going to be respired to provide energy for growth so the energy is going to be released the energy is needed for growth how is this radical going to grow how is this plumule going to grow and develop into the leaves it needs energy so it has to be respired to release energy now actually what happens is when you soak uh, the seed it actually the embryo releases an uh, a hormone called gibberellic acid ga and this of course results in transcription and translation and amylase is made so an enzyme amylase is not made unless we soak the seeds because it's a waste of energy waste of the amino acids so seeds contain stored food in the cotyledons to provide energy and materials for growth this is usually in the form of starch a large insoluble molecule that keeps the food immobile the starch needs to be changed into soluble molecules glucose with the help of enzymes for the seeds to make use of so how do enzymes aid in germination now basically you've got to understand is that when you provide the right temperature water and oxygen the seeds are going to imbibe the water and swell up the testa softens and splits enzymes are activated because the watery medium activates the enzymes and the following reactions take place in the cotyledons where food is stored you see the enzymes amylase and maltase will be produced they are not produced when it was in the dry state or when the seed was in the dormant state but now that you have provided it water and an adequate temperature 
And of course, oxygen is present then, then also, but it is present now as well. So starch is broken down to glucose by amylase and maltase. And this is going to be then respired and energy for growth and making new cell walls is going to take place. Another wordings, uh, which I, I always feel is that you must know the wordings, how you're going to write this in the papers. So enzymes and C's break down stored food substance into soluble end products, which can be translocated to growing regions. Starch is broken down to maltose by the enzyme amylase. The fats and the oils are broken down by lipase to fatty acids and glycerol. Maltose and fatty acids are respired to provide energy for growth. Now, similarly, as you know, all seeds also have proteins. So proteins will be digested to amino acids. And the amino acids will then be used to make new proteins. So that is why whenever you have uh, lentils or uh, beans, you're actually getting a lot of proteins in it. So seeds have a lot of proteins in their cotyledons. And the proteins will also be digested to amino acids. And then, of course, the radical, the cells of the radical, the cells of the plumule has to have a cell wall and a cell membrane has got lots and lots of enzymes in it. So basically, that plant has to make its own enzymes. And every cell must have its own enzymes. So every cell will have enzymes. Every cell will have uh, some proteins which are uh, for active transport in the cell membrane. So they're called channel proteins for active transport. So all these proteins in the new cells will actually be made from the store. So the cotyledon, the store, the proteins in the cotyledons will be digested to amino acids. And then the amino acids will be used to make new proteins. Now, of course, when the fruit is made and the seeds are made, now the seeds must be dispersed. Why? Because they must colonize new habitats. The seeds must be dispersed so that the competition is reduced. Because if you have a tree and all the seeds just fall here, then there's going to be a lot of competition. But these seeds, if they're carried far away and then they're going to develop somewhere else, new habitats, so they will colonize new habitats. So this is how you have to understand why fruit and seeds need to be dispersed. They need to colonize new habitats. They need to prevent competition because if they just fall near its parent plant, then they're all going to be, there's going to be overcrowding. So what we have to understand is the two types of dispersal that we have to study is animal dispersal and wind dispersal. Now you have to understand animal dispersal is very different than wind dispersal. In wind dispersal, the seeds will be very light because they have to be carried by wind. Now, seed dispersal by wind, of course, are gliders, they're parachutes, they're flutterers, and they're helicopters. I mean, these are different names given to it, but actually the shape of it which matters is that they can be easily carried by wind. They are buoyant. The word that we use is they are buoyant. So they are buoyant, that's why they are carried by wind. Wind dispersed food as the flower dries out into a hollow container inside which seeds are rattled out. Or in the case of dandelion, feathery hairs help the seed to float on the wind and they can be carried very far this way. Then another one, sycamore, they are spinners. Its wings make it spin like a helicopter and carry it far from the parent tree. So wind dispersal is the most common for smaller, lighter seeds. Seed dispersal by wind. Seeds are light. They are flown from one place to another by wind. Some seeds have hair and wings over their coverings. They help them to fly long distances. Now we have to look at dispersal by animals. Now dispersal by animals can be three ways. Number one, first way. The seeds of fruits have hooks or sticky hair that catch onto the fur of animals or clothing of human beings. So whenever the animal walks a few a distance, a few miles away or a few feet away or goes walking and then of course it brushes itself and then the, the seeds fall off. Second way, fruits can be eaten by animals and seeds are thrown onto the ground as they're too big to be eaten by animals. Just imagine a monkey eating a mango. Well, the monkey cannot eat the seed. So the mango is very sweet, very delicious, has a nice uh, aroma. And then the mango is eaten by the monkey and then it, the seed is thrown onto the ground. And if it is uh, desirable, then the seed will germinate. All the fruits and seeds get eaten by animals, but the seeds are too hard to be digested by animals and are passed out in the droppings. Like uh, berries are eaten by birds. And then in the feces, the seeds are passed out miles away from the parent plant. Third way, animals collect the fruits and seeds and take them to their burrows. And then they bury them and then they forget where they buried them. And then they will germinate if the temperature and the environment becomes conducive 
and then they will germinate. So these are the different ways by dispersal by animals can take place. Seed dispersal by animals, sticky seeds cling to the fur of passing animals and then fall off. These seeds are commonly known as burrs. In some trees, the seed is in the middle of a fruit. When an animal eats the fruit, it cannot digest the seed and the seed is expelled when it goes to the bathroom or when it poops. Nuts are collected and hidden by animals like these skills and some of these are buried and forgotten about. So it seems that squirrels don't have a very good memory. So they forget where they buried them. Deer eat fruit. Seeds are not destroyed as they move through the animal's digestive system. Seeds are dispersed in the animal's poop. Squirrels hide nuts each year, but for the winter, but forget where some are located. Poor squirrels. I mean, sorry for them. Now, this completes 16.3, which is sexual reproduction in plants. And thank you very much for subscribing and for watching. May Allah always guide you on the righteous path. I mean, and please do leave any comments if you have any issues or if you have any problems regarding these videos and please do give me some feedback. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.